Our story begins in February 1962, when Hollywood starlet Marilyn Monroe, amid the glitter and tumult of a career that had seen as many highs as lows, sought solace in the form of a Spanish colonial-style house in the Brentwood neighborhood of Los Angeles. Purchased for $75,000, roughly equivalent to $780,000 today, it was the only property she ever owned independently, speaking to her desire at the time for a personal sanctuary amid the swirling storms of her life. You see, the year 1961 had been particularly trying for Monroe. The luminous, some like it hot star's career, although illustrious, was marked by recent professional setbacks and personal struggles, including health issues and a publicized battle with depression. In acquiring the house, Monroe perhaps envisioned a new beginning, or at the very least, a stable retreat from the relentless pressures of Hollywood. And the home, complete with thick walls and a secluded garden, promised a respite from the public gaze. In a move that would prove eerily prophetic, she had the Latin phrase, cursum perficio. My journey ends here. Placed above the front door, an echo of her longing for finality and peace. Thus, tragically, Monroe's time in her beloved home was cut short, and she lived there for only six months before her untimely death, in this very house, from a drug overdose on the 4th of August 1962. Over the years, the property would see numerous owners and renovations, each altering its character, yet the essence of its tragic former owner lingered. Fast forward to July 2023, and the house, purchased for $8.3 million, despite its storied past, now has new owners who are vigorously fighting to demolish the historic structure to expand their adjacent estate. It's a move that has ushered in massive legal battles and sparked debates over the preservation of Hollywood's tangible links to one of its most iconic stars. In today's episode, we'll first share with you a full tour of the home, complete with a room-by-room -room analysis. Then, we'll take you through a few other notable homes of Marilyn Monroe's, before wrapping up with a full breakdown on whether the home itself will indeed be demolished, as we describe why Marilyn Monroe's iconic mansion could be demolished. If you were to step into 12305 Fifth Helena Drive in Brentwood, Los Angeles, you would discover a property absolutely oozing cinematic history as the final, and only independently owned, home of Marilyn Monroe. Constructed in 1929 and acquired by Monroe in February 1962, this one-story hacienda-style residence stands as an iconic representation of Spanish colonial revival architecture, exuding rustic allure alongside elegant simplicity. Now, the home occupies an almost 3,000-square-foot lot, secluded at the end of a tranquil cul-de-sac, and the L-shaped layout is defined by its adobe walls and quintessential red-tile roofing, elements synonymous with its architectural style. The entrance leads into a welcoming living room with vaulted ceilings crafted from wooden beams and planks. This design choice emphasizes the natural beauty of the materials, fostering a warm, inviting atmosphere. And the room is further enhanced by a fireplace, its surround adorned with tiles personally selected by Monroe during her visits to Mexico. Naturally, Monroe's influence permeates every corner of the residence. Her choice of Mexican furniture, art and tiles infuses the home with a deep sense of authenticity and personal connection. And these selections resonate particularly in the dining room, repurposed by Monroe as a den, which features built-in cabinetry and a wooden beam that often served as a backdrop for her photographs. Now the kitchen, extensively remodeled during Monroe's residency, melds functionality with flair. Originally equipped with a quaint breakfast nook, the kitchen retains the original positions of key fixtures like the stove and hood, preserving the historical integrity of Monroe's modifications. Going further, the master bedroom, a serene escape, offers direct access to the lush backyard and its kidney-shaped swimming pool. This room, equipped with its own fireplace and an exterior door relocated during renovations, provided Monroe with a peaceful retreat. And the house, initially with two bedrooms, 
also included a dedicated telephone room, reflecting the necessities imposed by Monroe's celebrity status during the 1960s. Outside, the grounds feature a distinctive swimming pool and a citrus grove, areas where Monroe enjoyed leisurely afternoons with her poodle. And the pool area, largely unaltered, offers a historical view into her private life at the residence. An additional structure on the property, a small guest house, was under renovation by Monroe at the time of her passing. And this space, now integrated with the main house, has expanded the living area and enhanced the home's overall functionality. And yet, this home was merely the culmination of a life imbued with a highly cultivated sense of style, architectural subtlety and interior design. In the next chapter, we'll compare and contrast this home, Marilyn's final abode, with the other residences she lived in over the course of her iconic life. Now, Marilyn Monroe's journey was intricately mirrored in the homes she chose, each reflecting the multifaceted layers of her personality and her changing roles. For example, her early housing was humble, echoing her modest beginnings. And as a nascent model and actress in the throes of ambition, Monroe occupied various functional yet unpretentious apartments and hotels across Los Angeles. But with the ascent of her career, her choice in homes began to reflect a maturing palette for style and comfort. By 1952, she had taken residence in a Spanish-style villa, echoing what would become the Spanish-infused style of the final Brentwood home tucked into the Hollywood Hills. This 3,300-square-foot home radiated charm with its robust wood-beamed ceilings and French doors that led to a terracotta terrace. Briefly shared with Joe DiMaggio during their ephemeral marriage, it presented sweeping views of the canyons and a glimpse into the opulent lifestyle that was unfolding before her. Following her separation from DiMaggio, Monroe transitioned to a penthouse in the Granville Towers in West Hollywood. This example of a 1930s American attempt at French Normandy-style architecture, conceived by Leland Bryant and Samuel Coyne, captured the quintessence of old Hollywood's allure. And the penthouse spanned two stories and 2,032 square feet, marked by floor-to-ceiling windows offering expansive cityscapes, a graceful staircase at the entry, vaulted ceilings and hardwood flooring throughout, complemented by cosy window seats from which she could contemplate Hollywood's luminous expanse. Next, Monroe's stint in New York was marked by a zeal for reinvention and artistic advancement. She resided near the actor's studio to immerse herself in method acting under Lee Strasberg and also spent intervals in Connecticut, living beside photographer Milton H. Green in a converted farmhouse. These were transformative years, setting the stage for her emergence as a serious actress. But one of her most notable residences before Brentwood was the New York City apartment she shared with playwright Arthur Miller. Positioned on the 13th floor of a pre-war edifice on East 57th Street, the 2,190-square-foot space was both airy and cultivated. And it was within these walls that Miller penned the screenplay for The Misfits, Monroe's last film. In each residence, Monroe favored a minimalist monochromatic design palette, predominantly decorating in shades of white, which lent a serene and refined atmosphere to her surroundings. Her affinity for art was prominently displayed through her decor, with her spaces graced by works from luminaries such as Rodin, Goya, and Picasso. Thus, Marilyn Monroe's residential choices were more than mere places of dwelling. They were profound reflections of her personal journey and evolution, marked by her shifting fortunes and the pivotal transformations in her life and career. Yet by early 1962, her fortunes were indeed down, and she saw this new home as the rightful locale to get back on her feet, despite trouble awaiting, as we'll see in the next chapter. On the evening of the 4th of August 1962, Marilyn Monroe's vibrant life came to a tragic halt within the quiet walls of her Brentwood home at 12305 5th Helena Drive, Los Angeles. Earlier that day, 
despite her hectic schedule, which included a photo session with Lawrence Schiller and casual conversations with friends over the phone, Marilyn's life seemed as glamorous as always. In the home with her were her housekeeper, Eunice Murray, and publicist, Patricia Newcomb, both of whom were part of her closely knit circle. Tragically, late that night, Eunice Murray discovered Marilyn lifeless, a scene that marked a poignant end to her storied life. Following the icon's untimely departure, her cherished Brentwood residence swiftly became a beacon for curiosity and nostalgia. The house was enveloped in a flurry of interest, receiving at least six purchase offers the day after her demise. The Nunez family ultimately won the bidding war in 1963, acquiring not just the house, but also its contents, which they later auctioned off in 1997. And as the 1960s unfolded, the surrounding Brentwood neighborhood where Marilyn had lived began to evolve. Originally a quiet suburban area, it started drawing wealthier residents and celebrities, charmed by its seclusion and closeness to the heart of Los Angeles. The Brentwood Country Mart emerged as a favored haunt, offering quaint shops like a bakery, meat market and deli, adding to the community's charm. San Vicente Boulevard blossomed into a hub of activity with small businesses that enhanced the local vibe. Furthermore, architecturally, Brentwood saw significant transformations during this era. Known for its Spanish colonial, much like Marilyn's last home, Georgian Revival and Tudor homes from the 1930s, the area began embracing the sleek lines of modernist architecture. Enclaves like Crestwood Hills showcased the work of architects such as Richard Neutra and A. Quincy Jones, who designed homes that blended beautifully with the natural surroundings. And as decades passed, Brentwood's allure only grew. The 1990s saw a spike in population and development, with new residential areas springing up around amenities like the Shadow Lakes and Deer Valley Golf Clubs. Gated communities like Carmel Estates further enhanced its reputation as an exclusive and sought-after locale. As the new millennium unfolded, Brentwood experienced a robust economic surge, characterized by a flurry of activity in both residential and commercial construction. In 2008, the opening of the streets of Brentwood further enhanced the area's appeal, introducing an outdoor lifestyle center that provided upscale shopping and dining experiences tailored to the affluent locals. The economic vitality of the area continued to strengthen throughout the 2010s, with housing developments frequently showcasing properties priced from the mid 500,000s to over 1 million US dollars, often equipped with extensive upgrades. And architectural innovation remained a cornerstone of Brentwood's appeal. The neighborhood boasted several modernist gems, such as the Warwick Evans House, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., and the Barrington Residence, a pinnacle of ultra-modern architecture that redefined luxury. These homes, typically secluded behind lush hedges and secure gates, offered the privacy and exclusivity demanded by Brentwood's affluent residents. Yet, beneath this veneer of moving from strength to strength as one of Los Angeles' most sought-after neighborhoods, in the last decade, Brentwood has played host to one of the most ferocious historical preservation battles in LA's history over the very Marilyn Monroe Brentwood mansion we've been discussing. Decades after the death of Marilyn Monroe, the home she once owned in Brentwood has ascended to a position of notable historical importance. A symbol of the Hollywood legend's personal life and status, this property recently became the center of a high-profile preservation debate. In 2017, Glory of the Snow, an LLC managed by Dan Lucas and Anne Germain, acquired the residence for $7.25 million. But by 2023, the ownership transitioned to a trust that sought to demolish the house, triggering a passionate public backlash and efforts to safeguard the site. Yet, the response from the Los Angeles City Council was quick and forceful. Tracy Park, representing Brentwood in the city's 11th district, led the charge to preserve Monroe's former residence, and Park proposed recognizing the house as a historic cultural monument, an example of its status as Monroe's final home and the sole property she owned. Then, 
This proposal received backing from both the City Council's Planning and Land Use Management Committee and the Cultural Heritage Commission. Additionally, the campaign to save Monroe's house resonated widely, attracting the support of preservationists, historians, and legions of her fans. Influential groups like the Los Angeles Conservancy emphasized the building's architectural and cultural value, pointing out that it offered a rare insight into the life of one of Hollywood's most timeless figures. Despite the fervent public support, the new owners, Brynna Milstein and Roy Bank, who purchased the estate for 8.35 million, are adamant about demolishing it. They contend that significant renovations have stripped the residents of any direct links to Monroe, and they raise concerns about the potential increase in visitor traffic, arguing that the landmark designation process favored by the city was flawed and unconstitutional. Thus, a contentious legal battle has ensued between the city and the property owners. Milstein and Bank accused city officials of opaque dealings intended to ensure the property's landmark status. And they allege that the designation was rushed, claiming that the city had colluded with external entities to manipulate the outcome in favor of preservation. Despite these objections, on the 26th of June 2024, the Los Angeles City Council cast a resounding vote. With unanimity, council members declared Monroe's last residence a historic cultural monument. The vote, 12 to 0 in favor, not only underscored the property's cultural and historical significance, but also placed it among the city's protected sites, a list that encompasses around 1,300 locations, including roughly 444 private residences. In her remarks, council member Tracy Park highlighted the significance of Monroe's legacy, particularly noting the scarcity of historical designations in Los Angeles connected to women's contributions. This designation, she argued, was not merely about preserving a structure, but also about honoring the enduring influence of women in shaping the cultural landscape of the city. Now, this decision triggers a stringent review process for any future attempts to alter or demolish the property, effectively shielding it from immediate developmental pressures. Nonetheless, the contention surrounding the house is far from resolved. Milstein and Bank are pushing forward with their legal challenge against the city's decision. And a trial setting conference has been scheduled for the 13th of August 2024, which will further address the complexities of the lawsuit. As this legal confrontation unfolds, the fate of Monroe's Brentwood home hangs in the balance with its potential demolition stirring a broader discourse on the value of preserving cultural heritage versus the rights of property owners, especially when the property in question was once home to an iconic figure like Marilyn Monroe. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Who do you think is in the right here? The lawful owners of the property or the local government for trying to preserve a part of history? We love hearing your personal analysis of each topic we post so don't be shy and let us know your thoughts below. With that said, thanks for joining us for another episode of Old Money Mansions, and cheers until next time.